All right, Doug, there you go. <laughs> I hate putting this song in your mind. Everything for my home, you got it mm -hmm. for me. I've never seen selection quite like this. Every color and size in my mind. They have every single thing on my list. And with 70% off, who knows what I'll find. Wait there, you guess what I need. Everything for my home, you got it for me. Wait there, and the shipping was free. Now my home's the home I wanted to be. Shop everything home at Wayfair.com. <laughs> Wayfair, you got just what I need. What did you come here today needing? We are going to take a bullet train look at some uh, characters, instances, verses in the Bible that talk about people who have needs. But before we do that, let's pray. Lord, as we open your word, as we look at human nature, and as we look at your answer to that today, I just pray that you'll be with us. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's lots of needs in the Bible. I'm going to start with one, Isaac. And God came to Isaac as the son of Abraham and said to him, I will be with you like I was with your father, Abraham. Jacob Jacob, we know, was a great deceiver. Mike's going to talk a little bit more about him, so I'm not going to take away his thunder. But it was amazing to me that Jacob, in running away from what he had done and what he thought he needed, and God says, I will be with you. Moses. Moses is told, you're going to go, you're going to retrieve my people from Egypt, and you're going to bring them back to the promised land. And Moses says, who am I? And God doesn't say, well, you're Moses, and I've given you a special name, and I saw you when you were the baby in the little basket in the ark, and the, you know, Moses. No, he doesn't say anything about who Moses is. All he says to Moses is, I will be with you. Joshua. Joshua, he comes to Joshua because Joshua now has to enter the promised land. What does he need? He needs an army. He needs people that are going to fight. He needs to be able to take care of all those Canaanites and Hittites and Jebusites and all the ites that are out there. That's what he needs. But God comes to Joshua and he says, don't be afraid. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not abandon you or leave you alone. And later, verse 9 in Joshua 1, he says, I repeat, this is God, I repeat, be strong and brave. Don't be afraid and don't panic. For I, the Lord your God, am with you in all you do. Gideon, Gideon, Gideon had to fight too. And the angel of the Lord comes to him and says, the Lord is with you, courageous warrior. Had he done anything yet? No. Was he courageous? No. Gideon says, um, pardon me, Lord, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this disaster come upon us? Um, where's all the miracles like you did for Moses and the children of Israel. You know what? It sort of appears that the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites or a pandemic. Might throw that in there. And God says, haven't I sent you? And Gideon says, but my family, they're the smallest. I need a large family. And I'm the youngest. I need to be older. And God says, ah, but I will be with you. Solomon I will be with you, Solomon, as I was with your father. Isaiah 41.10. In fact, the kids are doing these scriptures here today. So we'll need to see them at the end. Don't be afraid. I am with you. I strengthen you. Yes, I help you. Yes, I uphold you with my victorious right hand. Isaiah 43, 2-5. This is to the church. This is to us today, to Israel. Fear not. For I've redeemed you. I've called you by your name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, I can't speak. God says, don't say that. <laughs> He's saying, I, I need a mouth that speaks well. I need to be able to, to talk and You've given me this job, and I can't do it, just kind of like Moses. And God says, don't say that. 
You will go wherever and to whomever I send you. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. Well, and they will fight against you, but they will not prevail or win against you. For, two times, he tells him, for I'm with you to deliver you. Paul in Corinth, God says, I am with you, Paul. And Paul's valedictorian speech in uh, 1 Timothy 4.9. He says, Demas has deserted me since he, since he loves Wayfair. Just thought I'd throw that in there. If you go back and read the verse, he is alone Everybody's deserted him, and he's talking to Timothy. Bring Mark, bring my cloak, bring my scrolls. And it says, then he says, when I had to go in front of everybody, and nobody was with me, when I had to give my message, nobody was there with me. Nobody appeared in my support, instead all deserting me. But he says, but the Lord stood by me. God is with us. What is your need today? How is he going to meet that need? Let's find out. Good morning. My wife does a good job with Wayfair and stuff like that. She asked me, by the way, when we were talking... day before i had to find something shiloh by the way pray for us shiloh and i women's ministries we are embarking on something brand new it's going to be a production uh, for tweens and she needed a stool that was fuzzy and furry and had pink and i went into home goods and i looked for one and it was just what i needed <laughs> and when i sent a picture shiloh was where is she she was so excited anyway, just what she wanted. boy i'm i'm excited too Okay, um, Gail talked about a lot of characters in the Old Testament that God stood by. Um, one of them, I, I think you mentioned Jacob, didn't you? Yes. Jacob is a very familiar person to us in, in the Old Testament uh, for some mostly not very good reasons, right? Um, I mean, he's, he's a hero also, but he's got a lot of flaws, um, if you turn in your Bibles or your electronic device, whatever, to Genesis chapter 28, verse 1. Okay, it says uh, in New King James, it says, Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Go and, right, and so this, this is the beginning of his, his uh, married life. But what did Jacob want that he couldn't have, but God told him he was going to have it. You remember? He, by birth, he was the, uh, the second of twins. Who's his brother's name? Esau. Now, he was a mother's boy. Mama liked Jacob better than she liked Esau. Daddy liked Esau. And you all know the story about when he came home one day and his mom says, look, we've got to do something because daddy's failing. He's not going to live to him too much longer. So I want you to go get a little kid goat and we're going to want to fix him a meal. You all remember the story. He takes it in because he disguised himself, puts some fur skin on his, on his forearms, and, and then he tries to lower his voice and sound manly. Serves this meal to his father, and the father said, I want to give you my blessing. So he does give the blessing, walks out. A little while later, big brother comes walking in with a, a, a big animal that he has conquered, killed, and dressed out to give his father the meal. And the jig is up because father Isaac knows that he's been taken. Well, when mother hears this, she sends Jacob packing. You've got to get out of here. Your brother might do something bad to you. Now, the trip that he was going to take was, think about this. How many of you... On a, when you're going on a, a lengthy trip somewhere to see family or going on vacation, whatever, uh, how many of you, a 500-mile trip in one day is doable? Some of you, okay. Um, how many of you would rather t split that 500-mile trip up into smaller lengths? Okay, 
if, especially if you've got kids or whatever. Uh, Gail and I used to, when we first started in ministry, our first district was Mount Pleasant, Michigan. From there to where my mom and dad live in Chattanooga was 750 miles. And what we would do is we would put the kids in the back. Of course, no car seats back in those days. You didn't have to do that. So we just put them in the back with a box of Cheerios at night, let them do whatever, fix, figure out we could clean it up when we got there. They couldn't do any serious damage with Cheerios. And we would drive all night long. It was about 13, 14 hours, whatever. 15, my wife says. She would remember better than I. We didn't, we didn't think anything of it. We were in our mid-20s. We were young. We were healthy. We were energetic, all that kind of stuff. We just drive all night long because there's less traffic. And finally, after the kids finished off the box of Cheerios, they'd fall asleep, right? No big deal. But now think about this. Taking a 500-mile trip on foot. Seriously? Would you... And, I mean, that's what they had to do back in the day. I mean, maybe, or maybe unless you had a donkey, but he, you know, he didn't. He has to walk 500 miles to get away from his big brother because he has ripped him off. Now, remember, God did promise him the birthright, Jacob, I mean. But he didn't, he didn't bother to let Jacob in on how he was going to get it to him. And so Jacob said, I'm thinking God needs some help here. So I'll just work this thing out because God doesn't appear to be showing up. God doesn't appear to be with me. And so Jacob did his version of getting the birthright. Isn't it? Think about when, when we don't think God is with us and we do stuff on our own. How well does that work out for us? Not so much. Now, I would, I would love, and this, you know, how many of y'all have questions that you want to ask God when you get to heaven? You know, this is one I'd like to find out. God, what were you planning to do in order to give Jacob the birthright when his brother, really by rights, was the one that was supposed to get it? How were you going to work that? I just, it doesn't matter. It's no, not a big deal. But it'd be interesting to find out what God's plan was. Because we, we will never know now because Jacob, you know, we, history is what it is. So he's a 500-mile trip to get to his homeland. Okay? I mean, that's, that's a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of walking, a lot of traveling. Um, it's interesting because at, at the beginning of this journey... Um, what, what verse is it, Gail, that we look, look, found that said that Jake, that God was with him? And it's also at the end of it. In what, chapter 8, 28? Okay, chapter, Genesis chapter 8, 28 and verse 10. Okay. Now I have a, I'm, in the New King James, uh, they put a heading in here that says Jacob's vow at Bethel. Okay, here's verse 10, read with me. It says, now Jacob went out from Beersheba, and went forward to Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. He took one of the stones of that place and put it at, at his head and lay down at that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending upon it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. And I don't mean lies, but once you lay down, was it saying, I will give to you and your descendants. And he reiterates the promise that had been given to Abraham and to Isaac. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And in you all, your, and in, you, in your families or seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Okay, so, you know, when we, I think one time, uh, did we use a ladder here for something? Might have, but the thing is, is that when, 
when this word says ladder, and when you think of a ladder, you know, you all know what a ladder is. It's just a, you've got rungs and whatever. That's not really what this is de- depicting. Think, think more staircase, okay? And I, I'm talking grand staircase. Not, you know, we all have stairs in our home. This is staircase on steroids, okay? Because it's got these big ziggurat staircase that, w- that the Persians would make because they got that anor- ornate stuff at the bottom decorated. So it's a big, massive, heavy stone staircase. And the angels are going up and down because they were the messengers. They were going up to heaven to get, get orders and they came back down to earth to, to do whatever that they were supposed to do. And where was God in, in relationship to this staircase? Was he at the top? Was he halfway down? Was he at the bottom? Where was he? Pardon? Well, he, that too. But, but, there, but this actually talks about him being beside Jacob. Verse 13. It says, and behold, the Lord God stood above it and said, I look. But there's another place that implies that he wasn't just above it, that he was actually with Jacob. The point is, God is everything. He is everything. He is all we need. And that's what Jacob needed to know. He needed to know that he doesn't have to engineer his own salvation. He didn't have to do that. His, his joy, his peace, his happiness was through God and through God alone. It, he didn't need a Wayfair commercial and then get online with his ca- debit card and, and purchase something. Or to purchase something not with a debit card, but with his, his personal energy. His, I'll, I'll do this myself with my own actions. His own actions to this point had caused him to have to leave home to which he never really went back. So how good did that birthright blessing work out for him in his life? Not really that good. His his happiness um, was not that great. You know, I, I remember... Now, I might have shared this with you before, but in 1986, when I was just barely getting started with my ministry at um, Andrews University as the youth pastor there, uh, someone came to me, in fact, it was a good friend, Steve Case, who was teaching youth ministry at the, at the seminary at the time, and he says, Mike, he said, you need to get the kids there involved in um, over, not overseas, but out-of-country ministry, small, uh, short-term ministry. And I said, I love to do that, but I've never done it before. I have no uh, idea how to begin, where to start. He says, look, I'll tell you what. He said, I went on a number of mission trips, and I know uh, Bill, uh, Bill Smith out in California is the, the uh, youth pastor at P, uh, PUC. He said, I know that they're going to be taking a trip. He says, we'll, we'll hook up with them. He said, let's do this. Let's get um, uh, Lynn Bryson, who was a seminary student at the time, who was from that area. He says, if he can handpick four eighth graders, two guys, two girls. He says, and we'll just, we'll just take like a kind of a, uh, a, f- a first step, a first try. And uh, so that's what we did. And it was a wonderful experience. The kids loved it. had a great time. Um, uh, that was the trip uh, on which I ha- was involved in a, in a small plane crash. And I'm not going to tell that whole story. The point of it is, is that I, be- because of it, I ended up with a back surgery on, to repair lumbar too. In the process of doing that, they discovered that I had a, a birth defect down below. And, they, and after the surgery, they told my wife that he's, he's going to have at some point, he's going to develop chronic pain. Okay, whatever. So I didn't think much about that. Well, they were right. About five years later, I started to have uh, neuropathy in my left foot. 
And I say that only to tell you that Steve Case, the, the young man who got me involved in, in the trip, came to me to give me a book uh, to read in terms of dealing with the, the chronic pain that I was going to have to handle. The book was called You Gotta Keep Dancing by Tim Hansel. How many of you have ever heard of the book or read it? I'm just curious. It's been almost 30, well, it's been more than 30 years ago now. Um, you Gotta Keep Dancing um, is not about dancing. Um, the, the, the title comes from uh, a quote uh, from Tim Hansel of his father. And, and what it amounts to is his father once told me, he said, look, uh, you're going to have different things happen to you in your life, and they're going to sometimes knock you down. He said, but the, the, the key is that you get up and keep dancing. It's about being engaged in your life and not let little things or even some bigger things keep you down. He says, you just got to keep dancing. Tim used that for the title of his book, which, not, which was not about even just letting little things get in your way, but it was about a book about joy. And he, he said this because he said, you know, um, each one of us in the course of our lives is going to experience pain on some level, whatever, you know, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain or social pain, uh, financial pain. How many of you have ever, by show of hands, how many of you in your lifetime have experienced pain of one kind or another? All right. How many of you have not? I don't see any hands up. I was going to say, if someone put their hand up, um, one of two things, either they haven't lived long enough or they're lying. One of the two. Because all of us experience pain of one kind or another in our life. It's just, and what, what Tim Hansel said about that was this. He said, in this life, pain is inevitable. But he went on to say that misery is optional. You, you understand what I'm saying? You're going to have pain, but whether you are miserable or not is a choice that you make. In fact, he went on to say that, that joy is a choice. Amen. Joy is a choice. And there, let, let, me, let me throw a couple questions at you that are they're not, not really that tricky, but is it possible to be happy and not joyful at the same time? Okay? Is it possible to be joyful and not be happy? Okay, how many think yes? How many think no? How many are not thinking? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. All right, the answer to both questions is yes. You can be joy happy and not be joyful. You can be joyful and not be happy. And here's the reason why. The, the word happy, or, or its derivatives, happiness, that kind of thing, it is a, comes from a Latin word, which is happenair. And it really, it's translated from that, that word, which is to happen. It is, and, and to happen is a circumstantial thing. Uh, something that is driven by circumstances. For example, you buy a new car. Anybody bought a new car ever? Okay. When you get that new car, the first number of weeks, if not months, when you go to the mall, where do you park it? Way, way out. You ever seen a commercial where the, it's like an insurance commercial and you see these two guys, and you guys, one guy's got a hands on the steering wheel, and the other guy's sitting. And all you ever see are these, the, the, the faces of these two guys, that are, and they're going through the parking lot, and the, the guy that's passionate says, there's one. There, there's another one. There's, there's one. And then finally, they pan out, and the guy has just parked, and he's in this massive, huge shopping uh, mall parking lot, but he's passed up any parking space that is anywhere near a car, and he's out about what looks like a quarter of a mile away from He said, boy, I'm sure glad we found this good parking spot. 
And it was about the car. It was about the vehicle. Because when you first get a new car, you're so jealous of, to keep it looking perfect. And you, you wash it every week. And, you know, that kind of stuff. Vacuum it out. Because you don't want somebody that you parked to open, like a 1945 Buick with eight-foot doors. You know, and, I, and they don't care about their old car. So they just throw them open and bam. You got to... You're happy while that car is nice, but as soon as somebody puts a ding in it, are you still happy? Not so much. Because happiness is circumstantially driven. Joy, on the other hand, is... Now, does it affect our emotions? No question. But joy is something that is rooted in our relationship with God. In fact, it's one, it's one of the fruits of the Spirit. And it's not off again, on again, up, down, up, down. It is a steady upward climb uh, that is perfectly parallel to our relationship, our loving and love relationship with Jesus Christ. So joy holds steady through all the ups and downs of life. Because it is not circumstantial. Like I said, like Tim Hansen said, in this life, pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. You can... Ch how many of you have ever known someone that when you meet them, no matter how, many, how long you've, it's been since you've seen them, the, the first things that come out of their mouth is to tell you all their trials and troubles and tribulations, and they, and, and they do it in triplicate, verbally. They'll tell you the same thing over and over in the same conference because they are focused on them, themselves, and all the difficulties that they have had. They had this surgery, they had this, I was in a car accident, whatever. And it, it seems like, in talking about it, that it gets worse every time they tell it, and then they... They draw trouble to themselves by focusing on that and nothing else. What, do you like to be around those people? Not so much. So what you do is you find yourself running every time you see them coming towards you. We are not attracted to those who choose misery. We, we feel for them, but we, we, we just like, okay, enough, enough. Joy is a choice that we make in every situation, no matter good, bad, whatever, that we choose to be joyful. Paul said it. He said, my strength, or quoting God, he said, my strength is sufficient for you. That strength includes the joy of the Lord. In fact, there was a song we used to sing. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord. Y'all remember? Some of you don't, can't remember because you weren't old enough. Jacob was comforted by the fact. What's, what's the verse at the end of the chapter, Gail? Twenty-nine one. Turn to Genesis chapter 29, verse 1. Well, that's not exactly the one. Oh, okay. So Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the people of the east. And the, the verb for went on, and there's different even words that are used for that. Um, that word is a word that means to stay on course. He continued the course. He didn't turn from the right to the left. He, he stayed with it. Now, the whole, the whole idea of Emmanuel staying with us is foreshadowing what? Who came to be with us? God did. His name was Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And God doesn't take vacations. He doesn't take breaks. He doesn't, he doesn't need uh, 
counsel. He doesn't have a plan B. Nothing throws him off. He doesn't have ahas. Oh, never thought of that one. That's awesome. And God is not, God does not have potential. You ever had somebody, I remember one time when I first went to, to uh, Pioneer Memorial to be the youth pastor, the, the principal of the school, Buzz Orison, a very imposing man. He was, in, uh, he was intimidating to me. He just he had this, this kind of regal, almost kingly manner when he walked around the school. I mean, you expected at any moment people were going to come out with leaf fans and, you know, peel grapes and give them to him. He was just a very imposing guy. He called me into his office one day and said, Mike, he said, I really appreciate what you're doing here, but can I make a suggestion? I said, sure. He said, he said you are a people person, that's obvious. He said, you enjoy people, you enjoy the kids, the kids enjoy you, but he said, I, I, I would like to, to suggest that you focus not just on the, your people skills, but that you focus on uh, administrative organizational skills. Well, that was not a surprise to me, because that's not, uh, you know, we'll have our flat spots, that would be my flattest spot. And he said, if you, if you do that, he said, you will mark your ministry in a way that you will not if you don't do that. He said, you have, he said I, I believe that you have great potential. Now, was it flattering to hear some of the things he said? Yeah. But when I got out of that office, I didn't think hardly at all about the things that were positive. All I could think about was, oh my goodness, how am I going to I got to really show, show off for this guy. You know? I got to show him how, how organized I really am. But you know what? We are who we are. David didn't fight in Saul's armor. He fought without because his strength was God who was with him. And so I, I, the point is, is that all of us have potential because we are weak and sinful and erring and struggling. But God, God does not have potential. God isn't going to get better at being God. You know, we don't sit down and say, God, listen, I've been thinking about this. And, uh, you know, if you could actually just do, do a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that, I think, I think you'd be doing a lot better at being God. Say what? It's, excuse me, I'll, I'll, well, I was going to use a word that's probably better not to say. It, but it's really stupid to think that God has room for growth. Are we crazy? God is... He is totally beyond our realm of, 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 uh, of our ability to comprehend. And in spite of that, He sent His Son to become one of us. He... he is God with us? And, and Jacob was able to, to, to finally learn that lesson in a way that changed him so that when he finally met his brother, that he could humble himself to his brother. Do I still have that quote? I think I do. I brought with me a, a quote that if you were a student at, maybe I don't have it. There it is. If you were a student at Southern, uh, how, how many of you uh, attended Southern or graduated from Southern a number of years ago? It was, if, remember Philip Saman? Um, this was a, a quote that he was fond of quoting, regards whether it was in a classroom. I mean, he might quote it to you when you met out on the sidewalk, just walking around. Um, but this is from uh, Manuscript 5, 1891. So it was right after the time when the 1888 stuff was all going on. And there was a huge focus on righteousness by faith. Of, of trusting in Jesus for everything. And not leaning on our own righteousness. And... I want to kind of close with this 
and then challenge us a little bit, but it, said, it says this. Ye inhabitants of the earth, praise him. And why? Because through Jesus Christ, whose long human arm encircles the race, while, it's, while his divine arm, he, with his divine arm, he grasps the throne of the infinite. The gulf is bridged with his own body. And the atom of a world, now think about what he's saying, the atom of a world, meaning tiny, when compared to the rest of the universe. The atom of a world which was separated from the continent of heaven by sin and became an island is again reinstated because Christ bridged the gulf. That's a powerful statement. We, he, she says we were an atom, an atom of a world. Think about that. I don't know how many of you like to look at pictures of space when taken by, you know, science, those uh, little device. Can't even think what they are now. But we send up p things into sp NASA, right. And, and they take pictures all the time. And you can get online and see them. This universe is immense. And they say it's slowly growing. And so she says, the atom of a world, this tiny little speck. Now, we think of it as, we think of it as big. It's our home. It's, we have, we'll never see all of it. We'll never, you know, even if you want to travel for a lifetime, you could not see everything there is to see on this world. And it's a speck. It's nothing. But this, this planet with the people that God created. He has the highest and the su most supreme regard for this little race that has so screwed up the universe. Think about that. We're the only thing in the entire universe that has screwed up. And we were supposed to be the highest order of beings. And we screwed up. But God gave us his son, his own son. And with his human arm, he wraps this planet. And with his divine, he reaches out and touches the throne. God with us. God, God in us through Jesus. What a privilege it is that we have. I want you this week to... Keep your eyes and your, and, your, and your spiritual eyes and your ears open to see evidences of God being with you as you go through your life. God opening up your eyes to see evidences of where, as Jesus did, he says, I, I do what the Father tells me to do. And where I see him at work, I join him in that work. So keep your spiritual eyes open this week. To see evidence of God with you and God wanting you to work with him. Can we do that? Let's do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your love to us. We thank you for the incredible patience that you have with us. Being not willing that any one of us should die. But that all of us might be saved. We pray that Jesus will come soon so that we can go home to live with you and Jesus and the Spirit and all the angels and all of those who are waiting patiently for him to come. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a blessed Sabbath, y'all.